Uh, our next next speaker is um, Chris Santa Fernando. He's currently at DeepMind. Uh, he's famous for his work on uh, PathNet and um, other works on using uh, neuro uh, neuro evolution uh, for n to optimize uh, neural networks. Um, he was trained as a doctor, medical doctor, as uh, at Oxford. But then he did a PhD in uh, computer science. Uh, the origin of life. Yeah, origin of life. And uh, uh, now he's going to talk uh, to us about PathNet. Um, so when I first came to DeepMind, I was very interested in um, combining evolution and learning. But for the first year, I ended up just doing evolution because nobody believed in it. Um, so what I managed to do with Dylan was basically to evolve lots of uh, fairly small things. Evolution at the time was and um, is very good for evolving small controllers uh, of things. So here's some... Uh, simulated robots uh, doing locomotion with evolved continuous time recurrent neural networks, something we had used a lot in Sussex. Um, in another, uh, we saw a, uh, this cheetah in Peter Abiel's talk. Uh, so this is a very small neural network for 10 neurons that can produce that behavior. And we used methods developed by um, Jeff Kloon, who's probably here, to do diversity maintenance. So um, this is using Map Elite. So to evolve a whole bunch of different behaviors categorized by the absolute amount of force used and the, the, the average height of the torso during running. Um, so that's called map elites. And we evolved small neural networks with uh, structured visual filters, which this is actually just two logistic units to do very good um, driving on torque. So you can do torques basically with two neurons. Um, and uh, evolution is very good for that sort of thing. Moving around in a three-dimensional world, you can we use CPPNs to encode receptive fields with small numbers of um, uh, parameters and you know, a handful of neurons. So that was all fine, but when we get to harder problems, um, such as Atari games and uh, uh, first-person games, then really you need to have many more parameters. And uh, so for example, um, A3C um, has around 700,000 parameters. And recently, OpenAI has done a wonderful paper where they use evolution strategies to um, also optimize those kinds of networks. So there are ways in which um, it can be done. And there are other ways of compressing uh, uh, um, the number of parameters. So hypernets is a nice one, uh, which extends on the DPPN paper that we did, which extends on Ken's paper, uh, where a small network encodes the weights of a large network. So this is work by David Ha and others. So you put in the coordinates of the two neurons in the big network into the small network, and the small network outputs the weight between those two neurons. So um, it produces an interesting structure. But what I'm going to talk about um, today is another way to combine evolution and gradient descent. Um, and this develops on an idea that Ursh um, Sathmari and I talked about in Granada in, I think, I can't remember, another NIPS conference, um, exactly when it was. Um, the idea that evolution actually, some kind of natural selection, some evolutionary algorithm um, actually takes place in the brain, in the brain. Um, so uh, PathNet is one implementation of this. So currently we train our own oh dear. Currently we train our own separate neural networks. Each person um, trains their own uh, neural networks. But wouldn't it be nice if we could all train the same neural network? Um, so this is sort of one step uh, to the idea that, that such, a, such a thing might be possible. So we've taken the uh, A2C architecture. So it has three convolutional layers and a linear layer and two readouts, one for the, representing the policy and one for the value function. And here we've got um, two sets of those readouts. So for the source game, that is the first game, we're going to play in the second game called the target game. So I'm interested in a transfer learning setup. So I want to learn the second game faster than I could from scratch and faster than I could if I just fine-tune the 
the same network on the first game and then retrain that same network on the second game just straight away. So these are two important controls for transfer learning. You want to beat these two controls, the independent learning control and the fine tuning control. Uh, so what we do is to um, uh, break up the, each of those layers into little modules. And we actually, um, uh, in a lot of the experiments, made those modules a bit different. So some of the modules had skip, were just skip connections, some of the modules were residual, some of them were linears, um, maybe linears of different sizes. And uh, so you choose your set of modules. And then we're going to, the genotype specifies uh, a subset of those modules in each layer. So here we choose four out of um, 10 modules in each layer. The red uh, squares there are the modules that are chosen. Um, in each layer, and we're only going to train those, that subset of modules. Um, so we do the forward pass, we, we train, we do the forward pass through these four modules, and then we combine them with a reduced sum, we just add them up, and then we pass that, um, those activations to the, the next four modules that are chosen in the second layer, and so forth, until the end, and at the end we always train the same readout um, on the source game, and this readout on the target game. Um, so that's the forward pass, and then we do the backwards pass. Uh, we only update, we only apply the uh, gradient updates. Um, we only change the weights of this subset of modules that are chosen. So how do we choose this, uh, how do we choose these, this subset of modules? What we do is we have a population of uh, pathways through the network that um, are initially randomly generated and we play a set of episodes of the game with one pathway and we evaluate the fitness of that pathway which is the, uh, the performance of that, that set of parameters on that game. So these pathways are just views onto the same set of parameters. There's just one set of parameters and a pathway is just a view onto those. And each worker, so we have um, uh, uh, distributed setup where it's basically A3C. So we have like 64 workers, each playing uh, their own copy of the game and updating this one shared set of parameters. But each worker has its own uh, genotype, which tells it which subset of the path, the, the big network it's going to use to um, control its agent. So just to recap, we initialize a random population and then we do, so once a worker has finished, say, playing 100 games, it looks for another random worker and compares that worker's performance to its own. And then, if it's better, it copies the pathway from that other worker into itself with a uh, um, mutation. So here's a video of that happening. And what we find is the pathways rapidly converge into uh, one pathway, and then we fix the uh, weights of uh, that uh, pathway. Um, we fix the weights of that pathway and then we reinitialize another population of pathways and the workers then play that second game. So you can still back propagate through all those fixed weights that were learnt on the first game, uh, but we don't tra train those paths any, uh, those weights anymore. So we find that, for example, if we start a, a, the source game is River Aid, that blue, the path net, uh, shows greater, better performance on um, the range of games that we tried than both the fine tuning and the independent controls. So here's a, a, a sort of video of the transfer task. So the, the pathways rapidly converge to one path, and then we flip to the next game, and very rapidly the pathways converge to uh, with reuse of these red modules. Uh, so for another, here's another run. Convergence, uh, random initialization of new pathways. When I say, so all the parameters are just, um, it's just one shared set of parameters. Pathways are just views. So here's a sort of summary of the, the positive and negative transfers we see. Green is good, blue is bad. Oh. Um, yep. OK, 
Okay, shall I just carry on without slides? Um, the results are really good. The, most of the, the matrix here is green, so there's positive transfer. Um, the, can you come up? Well, while he's doing that, shall I just carry on? So we, we did this also in supervised learning. So we did a task called binary MNIST, uh, where you uh, show uh, one binary classification, so one versus two, for example, and then you train it on eight versus seven. And there's, on average, a positive transfer in that case compared to the, the fine-tuning controls. Um, there's a little video. Um, if you don't want to see that. So you can, train it, you can train many things at the same time as well. So I've, I've described uh, uh, sequential tasks, but you can also train two tasks together, um, hence the motivation of many people training the same network. So to conclude, um, PathNet is a good first step, I think, in one way of um, uh, reusing uh, combinatorially different neural modules and using evolution to decide which uh, parts of a, a, a large neural network to train. Um, effectively, it does a kind of architecture search uh, with sort of Lamarckian inheritance of these weights because it's just the same set of weights being trained, but the evolution is deciding to sort of chop and change those um, uh, modules. And an obvious extension is to make uh, uh, the choice of paths conditional on the image, um, but that has lots of uh, special uh, challenges, and so I can't talk about um, that at the moment. But, uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, Alexander. Very interesting. Um, I was wondering, um, so you saw that these pathways quickly converge to one uh, set of pathways that are being used. And that's something that you often see in evolutionary algorithms. And I wondered, uh, did you consider using uh, an explicit form of diversity maintenance to prevent that from happening? So, um, we have actually tried uh, the two diversity uh, costs that uh, Google Brain used in their outrageously large networks paper. Uh, so we've tried that. One of the issues is that actually for reinforcement learning, we want rapid convergence into one um, pathway so that we can, because the measure is uh, that we're trying to optimize is the total area under the learning curve and comparing that with fine tuning. The problem with fine tuning is often very good control. So if I use diversity for reinforcement learning like that, it's not really working as well. Okay, I can imagine that, although uh, there also seems to be a parallel with dropout, in that if you're using a subset of the network, uh, it could still work if, there are, yeah, if the, the pathways are doing something uh, not too incompatible. Yes, yes. Just Thank you. I have a really naive question. Uh, this is the first time in my life attending an evolutionary algorithm session, um, but I read once in a while. And uh, Carl Sims had a couple of papers in the 90s that evolved controllers. And those controllers looked very similar to the controllers that you showed in the beginning uh, of, uh, of your talk. So for, for an ignoramus like me, can you summarize what changed uh, in the last tw 20 years? Um, so I think nothing. Uh, so basically, I think the methods that are, have been used are very similar. I think I think there have been advances in, for example, natural evolution strategies, CMAS, the sort of information geometry way of looking at um, this stuff. That's pretty good. Um, I think, as far as genetic algorithms are concerned, I think we still are only scratching the surface. Of I, I could ask you the same question about bat propagation. I mean, what's changed in the last 20 years? Well, our results Large, look more quali the, the backprop results look qualitatively different. So, so the, right, yeah, uh, yeah, the so, networks uh, that are being optimized now are qualitatively on a, on a very sure. different level yeah. from 20 years ago. So, I think what's changed is basically computer power, and um, so the the open AI result I think demonstrates that uh, various tricks, such as using virtual batch normalization. Um, uh, early stopping surrogate models, these definitely um, can be used to scale things up. And I think we still don't know properly how to evolve neural networks. So there are probably little tricks that we're still to discover. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the benefits are in mixing evolutionary algorithms with uh, gradient descent. Yep. Uh, 
Okay. So I suppose uh, Ken is saying that one of the advances is also better ways of doing diversity maintenance. So that map elites example, uh, all those results are just from one run. Um, but no, I think Carl Sims was pretty good. Hi, thanks for the talk. So to do the uh, evolutionary computing here, you had to split the network into different models sort of in a discrete, discrete way, right? Uh, do you think it would be possible to specify sort of a continuous mapping of those, of those modules and perform a continuous assignment and then do inference over that? Yeah, so I, I've set myself the specific uh, limitation of having to use a sparse um, uh, uh, network. So I want this to generalize to networks that are very, very large. So I want to limit myself to using um, uh, hard uh, gating, but that makes the job harder. Right, so you, we could still do that, do that as, for example, using, I don't know, attention mechanisms over model parameters in, in different ways. I wonder whether there are any parallels. But if you use attention, don't you have to, um, like, back propagate through the whole thing anyway to decide what to attend to? Well, that's right, and then we have convex relaxations of, of, of for example, discrete light variables and so on. Anyway. I suppose I was, I didn't want to, I wanted to limit myself to a, a, a situation where I didn't, that propagates through the whole thing. Sure, thank but you. But maybe I don't understand what you're saying and you can explain no, it to me afterwards. That's all right. We can talk later. Okay. Thanks.